Aha, uh -huh. hello, hello. Hi all. Welcome to another King's Crusher radio show. So the King's Crusher radio, King's Crusher radio show is around 9.05 actually technically on Tuesday night, even though I might say 9. Um, oh, hello, hello. Oh, get rid of the echo. Okay. Uh, the most impressive Super Grandmaster to me at the moment, uh, well, from the European Cup at least, is Vladimir Kramnik. And you can tell the sparks flying among the two, um, among the the, the uh, super grandmasters. If you keep track of a site called Twenty Seven Hundred Chess, if you Google Twenty Seven Hundred Chess, you'll see what's happening in the skies. And at the moment, you'll see Kramnik at rank World Four. And actually, it has been noted that. Uh, the old timers are doing quite well at the moment because this uh, took, you know, f the five of the top 10, not five of the top 10, we've got Topolov, we've got An Anand, we've got Kramnik, we've got these old, old timers in the top 10, which is great. So, uh, yeah, chess doesn't end in your 30s, you can still carry on in 40s and more. So that's good news. Uh, so Kramnik, rank four at the moment. So what on earth has he been doing at the European Cup? And he's overtaken. Nakamura. This is on the current live ratings uh, list at 2700chess.com. So we're talking world rank number four. I thought we could make him the centre of attention tonight. So he's actually 2796.0, the same as Vichy Anand. Then we've got Topolov at 2803, and then we've got Colson at 2850. All right, the European Cup. Um, is uh, was a very very fiercely contested games. Now the first game I'd like to show you is against Ian <laughs> Nepianamachi. If you want a pronunciation of his game, I might be able to find it for those really interested in how you pronounce Nepianamachi. Let me just check. Now chess games com. As long as I mention them, I think they're okay. Me doing this. Jan nie pomni That's how you do it. Jan nie pomni That's a very good feature actually of chess games. Come if you want to check the pronunciation of players. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's great. There you can you can sometimes listen to that as well as wiki. So anyway, so playing black, very very exciting dynamic player. I've covered some of his games actually on the YouTube channel. So he's a very very dangerous player. Two seven zero five. <laughs> so Vladimir Kramnik at the time of this game two seven seven seven. So let's have a look. D four. What is slightly interesting, I'll say this in advance about these games, is not that they're smashing great attacking dynamic aggressive games, which are my cup of tea. No. What is particularly interesting to me about them, at least two of the three games that I'm going to show you, is how something strange he injects something strange in the opening which I I'm not used to personally and maybe a lot of other players are not used to but it's from this some strange opening uh, ideas which turn out to be absolutely amazing later that make these games kind of really uh, powerful okay so here d4 knight f6 nothing strange so far knight f3 g6 g3 so Catalan territory, very popular at the moment to avoid loads of opening theory. Both sides castling. And now we've got a move which um, I've personally tried in Blitz recently and I was basically attacked in the comments with good reason. Why would I play C3? I played C3 actually because I noticed that Fisher played C3 against Tau in the 1970 uh, Blitz championship the first unofficial blitz ball championship i think fisher beat Tao with this system c3 you might think this this is really timid stuff you'd think with the fianchetto bishop you want to like um you know put pressure on the diagonal 
And to do that, you want the pawn coming here to pressurize d5 and the light squares in general. But what it provokes is this kind of reassurance as though white's going to be playing something else, maybe on the dark squares. Actually, this flip the coin thing about playing on the dark squares or the light squares, I think one has to be open minded about things in chess. So maybe, you know, black plays b6 here thinking, well, maybe that, you know, whites can be playing on the dark squares. So he could do that, you know, with knight e5, bishop f4, and, you know, maybe try and strangle the dark squares later, you know, maybe something like this. All these are dark square plans. But the thing is, b6 does create some light square weaknesses which weren't there already. Can you guess? I can't take the arrows off. White to play here. Sorry, there's only 21 of you watching. White to play here. So, what would you play? Now, it's yes, it's move seven. But this is this is the interest of these games. They're strange in the opening. Pretty strange. What happened in the openings? So it's as if you're pretending to play on a dark square campaign. Sometimes that you might play on a light square campaign. Or maybe vice versa maybe that's a good trick hey I'm, I'm playing on the dark squares and then you know maybe the next move you, it's like you've lulled the opponent into a full sense of security yeah so venture a move here for white if you're on stream or on play chess well on play chess can you hide the score sheet please on play chess training tab or something okay so I'm just typing that on play chess no what he does now and it's profound yeah these opening uh, ideas for, for what happens later on is white actually like stutters c4 that stutter and in fact there is interest in playing on a light square strategy Let's put on the kibitz here actually as well, <clears throat> just in case. So black doesn't want to like take here. Obviously, this this looks like a bad idea for the diagonal, it just in principle, even if it's not immediately refutable. Black reinforces d5 with c6. The problem with this is this bishop actually hasn't got anywhere that decent to go in this position. We have knight e5. And now the knight can't move without dropping c6. So we have bishop b7. So the bishop is a bit of a problem piece. And it looks as though, even though white's lost a tempo, white looks to have a very comfortable position here with good pressure. And in fact, this next move now, forget about going for the king. It's the queen side. It's, it's the queen side squares. And these squares, which are put under greater scrutiny with queen a4 now. So threatening, perhaps knight takes c6. Yeah, so this is this is an annoying move on the queen side. It's also kind of tying down this rook now as well. A7, really annoying move. And it provokes, and it kind of limits black's options. What does he do without getting blown away in this position? Uh, you might think, could black play uh, like a defensive move? This, this might be an interesting. To, just briefly mention knight takes yeah and white might be slightly better just with taking actually to be honest uh as well as other moves so yeah black plays a radical freeing uh mechanism what he does is take on e5 and he plays knight e4 so yes he's temporarily doubled white's pawns and he's trying to get e5 back so we have knight takes e4 D takes. Now white's choice is here with these two pawns attacked. Should white defend e5 or take on e4? Well, actually he defended f4, so let's see why taking on e4 is that so bad. Well, this position here. Let's carry on with bishop takes c6. It's opposite. No, it's not opposite color bishops, pardon me. But it's no big deal. Rook c8. Apparently this this is about equal it's not such a big deal uh this c pawn is weak so that's going to give black some counterplay 
I think actually black's going to win this pawn back uh, pretty soon anyway. So, okay, it's no big deal to do that. And sometimes you, you want to, if you're playing for a win, you want to keep tension in the position. You want to keep the resolution of resources for both sides high. It's like having a high def monitor. You don't want to swap your high def monitor for something, a black and white TV. And to do that in chess, you keep the pieces on. He keeps the tension going. He doesn't want to take on e4. Might as well just agree a draw after that, taking on e4. Now he protects the e5 pawn. We've still got some grand plans afoot here, trapping this bishop, for example. Now black, with his e pawn attacks, you might think the obvious thing to do here is try and protect the e4 pat e4 pawn. If we play c5 here, what's the problem with that? It wasn't played. That's why I'm asking. It wasn't played. In the game, we have e3. Now on c5, queen c2 might be a good move. And then what? I think we can't counterattack this pawn because bishop takes e4. We're looking at the bishop. And white's going to be a pawn up. And that's pretty solid pawn. Uh, that's a pretty solid pawn up there, this position. On taking, that's, that's nice for white. Okay. So... We have black playing strange looking move e3 what is this about now again another slight little mystery why didn't white consider taking here actually that's the engine's choice it's not so terrible it doesn't lose the bishop or anything the bishop doesn't get trapped um this is okay as well but it looks a little bit horrendous in principle to have troubled pawns so anyway vladimir instead of having troubled pawns he he actually this is where he initiates the trade of prisoners, as Nimzovich would say. He takes on e3, allowing e5 to be taken. And now his plan really is to stuff this bishop up. And you see in a lot of Kramnik games, it's as though the opponent is playing a piece down almost. They're virtually a piece down. And here, this is the bishop to try and victimize. How does he do it? Well, he first he kicks the queen away and uses that d file. And now simply c5. So the bishop is looking a bit stuck on b7 now. And this is a pawn sack as well, temporarily. Black did actually take on b2 here, went back. And you might think, doesn't this kind of free up the bishop if we're losing our block? Well, have a look now. Bishop takes b6. Rook c1. There's still a kind of blockade on c5. So white's got a, a perfect position for torture. And he's got this past a pawn as well. I believe white looks visually much better in this position. I don't know about you guys. If you're positionally inclined, I'm sure you'd be liking this position. You've got some restraints on the black position. Backward pawn to torture, past pawn here bad bishop here your bishops are looking good you haven't got any loose pieces it looks pretty good how is black going to drum up drum up any counterplay in this position okay he plays queen g4 and yes there might be an idea of taking here or there might be an idea of queen a4 two two ideas we have rook c2 Uh, and and now that protecting here this is out of the question we just take on c6 after surely if queen a4 well we could consider just um, taking there and then rook d1 as well so black doesn't want the exchange of queens necessarily here he plays rook a6 we have bishop f3 and now queen a4 in this position in this position which isn't much better than what I've shown you actually because still white's having a very comfortable time of it he's first actually to control the center file here after the queen's come off rook d1 it's a, it's a real pain black seems to have been on the back foot is that is that a good expression black seems to have been on the back black foot since the the delayed move c3 to c4 i don't know if you would agree with that what has black exactly done wrong and yet he's been positionally tortured here this this is horrible to allow potential infiltration 
but how does black actually stop that and there might even be better than that anyway so bishop a8 and although rook d7 seems tempting and is the engine's top choice it wasn't played here uh, i'm not sure what kramnik was worried about it seems you know rook d7 is plausible what is it actually threatening maybe the idea is it's not threatening that much but with bishop c5 it, you know maybe you can go after some material but maybe you know he wants to torture black a bit more as well maybe he wants to keep the idea of rook d7 he plays bishop c5 keeping a locking key on the bishop imprisoned by its own pawn and saying you know Blimey, I'm doing this to a 2700 GM. You know, he's like playing like a bishop down here. Well, but anyway, rook b8. And there might be uh, some idea of this pawn being vulnerable at some point. It's secured with a3, just protected by the bishop. So forget about loose pieces. Make sure there's no loose pawns at all. e5 what else okay e3 we have e4 now a forcing move but so what bishop e2 bishop just drops back and it's still like a tortuous position rook b7 now what to do here to win this game well simplification now especially with this new weakness would seem desirable this is a new potential weakness so we have rook c4 simplify the position i know it's easy chess isn't it simple chess as michael steen might say in his classic book simple chess which is only five quid to download from amazon by the way uh, it's a good book on basic positional principles that i've got on my iphone but it's simple chess king g7 white controls simply the default he's basically a piece up in a way he's got a past a pawn lurking around here the bishops are also nicely complementing each other making sure that the bishops can't be nudged away by the rook it's a beautiful position and now the a pawn is pushed past a pawn bishop e7 seems a bit desperate black offering some simplification to try and relieve his problems white takes a5 this pawn is really dangerous it's potentially winning past outside pawn f5 okay at least the e4 doesn't look so weak rook d8 threatening the bishop it's protected a6 it's still torture the torture hasn't gone away king f6 rook e8 cutting the king off and the king can't even go here so the bishop and rook are working together to take away all the squares from the king coming into the game does that mean though does that actually mean the white king is going to venture uh in into uh the position c5 it's blocked by its own pawn king f1 yes given that the king is locked out the white king can take a wonder can't it king g7 king e2 it's poetry yeah it's poetry this game isn't it from that move c4 okay rook c8 yes saying okay do you really want me to win some material okay i'll think about it bishop d7 all right so that here uh you might think well actually does white even want to take that pawn is there a problem with taking that pawn uh it's let's let's have a quick look actually he played rook g8 check here which might actually be stronger if he takes here uh black might dare get some king activity king f8 and then go to e7 and if we don't we definitely don't want this position because it seems as though black's pieces have sprung to life no you want some you want the black pieces to remain dead especially the king so that's the thing with any move in chess whether it's a forcing move you play for reassurance that you're you're in control of the game uh you got to look does it give the opponent anything they didn't have before you've got to carefully scrutinize if i take this pawn that's another thing you might routinely do that in blitz 
but in the long game you carefully scrutinize does it give anything to the opponent you don't really want them to have give some peace activity we don't really want the opponent to have any peace activity yeah so every sort of move needs to be scrutinized like that so don't routinely just take a pawn rook g8 check kicks the create king into siberia land away from this pawn king h6 okay now now that the king's been kicked over there away from the action rook b8 simply threatening actually it would seem to be threatening rook b7 just winning immediately because this pawn's queening rook b7 so black has to stop rook b7 and now rook b6 so this king's actually further away from this dangerous past pawn and bishop a8 to protect the bishop bishop b5 looks as though now the king has also got sorry not not via d3 can also come over to win that pawn at leisure rook c7 king d2 the king's coming for that c5 pawn rook c8 king c3 king g5 yes this king is trying to do something is it trying to get back in the game it can't use that square so that's that's ruled out h3 just in case it's going to use g4 h5 king c4 and black plays h4 here now is there any threats on the horizon white plays rook e6 in this position and this coordinates with the bishop because bishop e8 is supported to attack this guy this is another weakness in black's camp g6 now after hg f takes g black felt his position was hopeless here he resigned in this position he resigned what does black do let's have a look at some stuff if king h8 h6 we have bishop e8 as an example just coordinating on g6 and then if i don't know both these pawns are about to drop off here it's about to explode the position is about to explode one drops off and then the other's going to drop off so he, he resigned not a moment too soon because this time you see it's winning material but without giving the opponent anything that's the ideal if you're going to win material do it in such a way not to give the opponent any counterplay any piece of activity nothing that's much better and and if you don't even have to then even win material the opponent just resigns it's it's completely positionally gone this position what does black actually do what does he do here if you think black isn't lost please speak now speak now if you think black isn't lost or any questions on stream <clears throat> if we play rook b8 again bishop e8 we're just going to coordinate to win this material and also c5 is dropping off again so yeah it's a positional masterpiece i mean because Niam Pinacci, you know, if you profile him, he's a dynamic, aggressive, tactical player. He wasn't given much counterplay. After this sort of game, I'd I'd think he'd, he'd want to try playing the king's engine defense or something, or anything. I, I don't think he'd want a repeat of this opening. So anyway that surprising move in the opening let me try and recap the story without actually showing you any position a delayed a surprising delay c3 to c4 once black had committed to b6 weakening his light squares the c4 put pressure on all the light squares we have moves like queen a4 which fit in with the light square pressure on the queen side black tried to lash out to generate some counterplay with this knight e4 move both of the pawns in the center were hanging that was navigated past just to try and expose a blocked in bishop on the queen side 
And White then uh, just uses a pawn. Some further simplification was able to make sure the Black King wasn't getting any part in the end game, and the Bishop was stuck on a8. So you have two pieces kind of disabled: the King and the Bishop on a8. Whilst the White King allegedly comes into the position, hits the c5 point, but also the Rook comes to e6 to hit the g6 point. So yeah, it didn't seem as though Black was given much counterplay. Okay, think about that game. Interesting. Let's have a look at another game. Okay. So brilliant game there. Svidler against Kramnik. This is even weirder in the opening. I've never seen this stuff before. Kramnik has 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 um, been visited by aliens or something. The opening is weird. Okay, so let's see. It was against Peter Zvidler, 2727. Two, okay. Uh, <clears throat> so Peter Zvidler against Kramnik in round four. Uh, he kicks off with c4, Peter Zvidler. We have e6, knight c3, d5, d4, knight f6, knight f3. Bishop e7, nothing unusual. This looks pretty bog standard. Another kind of Catalan, which is all the rage at the moment. Catalan, g3. Is this a Catalan? Let me just check. What does the score sheet say? Actually, it's got d37, Queen's Gambit to climb with Bishop f4. Well, it's kind of Catalan ish to me. As soon as, soon as White Fianchettos, it's Catalan ish to me. So, castles, Bishop g2. So how does Kramnik with black solve all the issues like of this c8 bishop etc <laughs> it's fascinating something remarkable about this position which would never have occurred to me because I think most of us would think with the black pieces here about fortifying d5 or somehow finding a place for the bishop somewhere now sometimes you would take on c4 for a light square campaign he plays d takes c4 okay now d takes c4 according to live book let's just check live book is the most popular move now we have knight e5 now usually black in this position there's 95 games in live with c5 and 79 with knight c6 even though knight c6 looks a bit on the ugly side actually this is this is a line where white i think takes with the bishop and i think kramnik's played with the white pieces i'm pretty sure i've seen him play with the white pieces and grind people down from this position but no here he's with the black pieces and he plays a move here which has only seen five games in live book. So a clue, it's not c5 and it's not knight c6. And what it seems to do is somehow magically give black some sort of initiative, which black shouldn't have on the queen side here, incredibly. Well, it pans out very well So black to play here. What outrageous move would you consider here? Black to play here. If you wanted to develop a queenside pressure situation against white. It's really strange. I mean, I'm hoping to be able to use this sort of idea in my own games. Knight BD7 is four games in live book, by the way. C6 is two, so it's not Knight BD7, good try. No, it's not B5, good try. <laughs> that loses a rook, I think. It's not Bishop B4, it's not Knight FD5. I, I, I don't know, can we, I really want to work this out with you, how on earth this idea is created what on earth it actually did it's just so weird this game so weird
Okay, I'm going to have to tell you. Um, queen d6. Queen d6. What on earth is queen d6, you might think? It does actually remind me of something at the back of my memory from years ago, actually. <laughs> this queen d6. It, I, I'm reminded now. I remember playing Adams, actually, in a quick play. Michael Adams. This was years and years ago. I remember him playing some sort of dull queen's engine defense. I remember his queen being on a6 at some point. I had this uncomfortable feeling. He's got this queen on a6 torturing my pawns. And... I don't know, it was just weird. But here we get an idea of a queen coming to a6 now. Uh, queen a6 is actually a threat in this position to hold on to this c4 pawn. If this pawn is not taken at this moment, I wonder what happens. Let's have a look. Queen a6 might actually be possible. You might think, what is this rubbish? Why can't we just play b3? Yeah, but maybe knight c6, knight takes c4, and the queen might actually be annoying on this diagonal because this bishop's committed to this diagonal, right? This diagonal might be slightly annoying. And apparently this, this gets to be equal, this position here. This gets to be about equal uh, from an engine point, nearly. Okay, so basically... Uh, it's like a, I don't know, a little cheeky move, queen d6. Knight takes c4 is played, queen a6. Okay, definitely there's a threat to take the knight. So queen comes to protect the knight. I don't know, if the knight goes back, if the knight went back, would it be so terrible? The queen still seems useful somehow on this diagonal. If we look at rook d8 and castling, I think the queen still is useful here, c5. And it's as if, although this bishop hasn't, we haven't solved this bishop's problem, it's like we've made the queen act as a bishop on, on a6. And if you think about it, well, where else would you want the queen in this position anyway? Well, I mean, maybe you'd want the queen here to sort of deliver a mate on h2. But apart from that, if you wanted the queen in a positional place, on a6 it does seem quite desirable here. So anyway, I think... Pitts Vidler's reaction is not to accept that position. He goes with queen b3 here. And then we have knight c6, which definitely looks at taking on d4, e3. And then we have rook b8. And in fact, the queen is supporting b5 here. It's not only supporting the b5 square, it's protecting that knight. So we might actually even solve the bishop problem from this strange queen placement here strange so white plays queen b5 this really solves basically all of black's opening problems are now solved with queen b5 virtually if white didn't play queen b5 maybe a4 was to be considered as an engine choice and this this is still slightly okay for white apparently but he plays queen b5 I and mean, what else if he didn't play a4 if he castles then we get this b5 and we're holding that knight yeah you do get these novelties sometimes in systems it's like, like in the perk where players with black find a, a sneaky way of playing b5 or in the Nimza Indian, remember the Aronian game against So, there's a sneaky way of playing b5. So maybe this whole queen d6, queen a6, is another sneaky way of playing b5, basically. Because once b5 is played here, what happens? You know, if knight d2, we can even play e5, and black's looking good. Black's looking good here. What is white doing? d takes, knight takes. We've activated our pieces. We're going to play this. Black's going to be great, uh, in great shape. So anyway, so White plays this move, Queen B5. So Kramnik takes, 
knight takes. Now there's an issue with the pawns, you'd think. But first knight before threatening knight c2 check to win the rook. Castles. And now instead of defending these pawns, rather elegantly, suavely playing just bishop d7, saying, look, either one of those pawns, I'm going to trap your knight. Your knight's going back here. Or it's supported with a4. Because if knight takes, I think we just trap the knight. Yeah. The knight's got no square. And same with that one. There's no there's no amazing resource here for white. Yeah, the knight's just getting trapped. So the knight goes back. Rook f c8. And it looks here with this bishop blocked in that black's pieces are great here, you know, for c5, b5. It looks absolutely as though he's done more than equalize almost. So we have a3, knight fd, uh, knight bd5, threatening knight takes and then bishop b5, which would be a torture on that diagonal, a skewer of these two pieces. So white plays bishop d2, but now c5, and look, we've got potential pressure on that c5. Again, threatening, black's got all the threats here. Black is threatening c takes d4 now, trying to win material. Or knight takes first, then c takes d4. So black, this is my argument. This is the miracle of the game. Black seems to be the one, can I use the expression, calling the shots. If the opponent is all of, all of the one, the one creating the threats, are, you can say that they're calling the shots, aren't they? How is black calling the shots here? This was supposed to be a game where black was to be subjected to torture and, and, the, and the bad bishop. What's happened? This has all gone wrong. What on earth has gone wrong here? Why is it this diagonal somehow has let black magically equalize? But it seems to be the case. It really seems to be the case. So anyway, D takes C5 is played. Maybe better. Well, the engine is disputing D takes. It's saying maybe 95 should be considered. Okay, and we're, we might claim something. But anyway, D takes C5. Rook takes C5. And it's as if the rooks are the first to double. Forget white's rooks doubling. The black rooks seem first to double. Knight E5. Bishop yeah, tucking the bishops like that. Looks, they look cute like that. Uh, so knight takes d5. Knight takes d5. And black again is calling the shots. He's threatening rook c2. Why is black threatening rook c2? How did this happen? How embarrassing. So rook fc1 trying to defend. Black just takes. He doesn't even bother doubling the rooks here to try and keep control. It's as if he's playing for the win now. He's not content with all the rooks coming off. And if you played like this, you might think, well, maybe rook c1 is possible. Possibly. Um, no, he, he's, he doesn't do that. He lets white temporarily seem to have the c-file. But he's got no support to challenge the c-file now. But it's these pawns... <laughs> A slightly weak. They're put under scrutiny. Bishop f6. Now possibly white should have considered the ugly looking f4 here. This is the engine choice. And maybe uh, white's okay here actually technically. Apparently. If we believe the engine evaluation. Rook d8 e4. Apparently, well, white looks okay anyway. If black's ever taking here, maybe this isn't so bad because you know white controls um, c5. If if rook c8, we can take here, and this this position might be okay for white. It's actually slightly better for white. So anyway, for some reason he didn't play f4. Um, maybe he didn't like the look of f4 for some reason. He plays. He wants to keep his structure intact. That's probably the reason. It doesn't like double pawns. So he plays knight c4 instead. With the idea of maybe kicking the knight soon. But we have rook d8. 
and now with rook d8 black is threatening something like well it's threatening b5 and bishop takes b2 basically so this b pawn's a bit of a target it moves to b4 and we have b5 and the knight's stumbling around in this position it hasn't got b2 it actually is put into siberia again i don't know kramnik's doing this with his opponent's pieces the knight really didn't want to end up on a5 here it's it's nearly trapped on a5 in this position knight b6 threatening the bishop bishop moves rook c8 again threatening the bishop and the thing is about this position is it's it's not very nice choices uh if let's have a look at bishop b2 uh black just takes that bishop in fact because the knight's protecting the rook <clears throat> bishop d2 better yeah uh but still bishop b2 would be good here for black and then we've got an a3 issue coming up we've got an incoming a3 issue no Peter's Villa tried to be a bit tricky here actually he played a trickier move bishop c6 interrupting uh the c file and trying to create a pin and stuff we have bishop takes c6 uh because let's have a quick look at this if bishop takes c3 bishop takes e8 then then we have got a reasonable position for white okay so bishop takes c6 bishop takes f6 but now this knight you see this knight the squares it's got we have this move bishop d5 which is basically saying i'm shutting your piece out of the game this knight is being restricted it's been totally restricted here and if the price to pay to get the knight out of that would be to play e4 at some point just to be able to get the b3 square it's a heavy price to have to lose a center pawn we have rook takes c8 knight takes c8 and this curious position where okay it's opposite colored bishops but uh, again you know kramnik has managed to embarrass a minor piece the knight what why why is there this position with this knight there i mean it's just a sequence of strange events from the opening have led to this position do we do we really want to give up a center pawn with e4 just to give the knight b3 i mean seriously we have to give up a pawn to get the knight out the engine is not suggesting that anyway if e4 yes that's just taken if knight b3 well actually this this, this bishop's hanging for a, for a start we <laughs> The, pardon me the bishop's got to move anyway forget about the knight for a moment the bishop's got to move i lost track of events there the bishop moves we have f6 this is, this is the point yeah now does he want to get the knight out with e4 here taken if we go here it is just a center pawn it's not a good idea just to give up center pawn so he lives he lives with the knight on a5 for a moment he plays bishop c5 And the king comes into the game king f1 okay the opponent in this game seems to have a better chance than the previous one in this end game because the opponent's king seems to be playing a role in the game there's no rooks which seem to make a lot of end games in some way more more like torture so is this going to be a torture session in this end game here we have e5 king e2 king e6 but still white is like playing like a piece down until he does a desperate pawn sack with e4 he plays for f3 f3 as though he's going to play e4 and try and get his knight out you know if the bishop has to go over there then we've got this coming out so an end is put to that f5 stop e4 h4 g6 okay now although black is virtually for this moment seems to be playing like with better pieces 
how does black actually win this well a3 is still vulnerable knight b6 to c4 would be funny potentially or just coming into the position maybe this pawn is vulnerable we have knight b6 at the moment the knight is guarding c4 though we have g4 now g4 why what was black fretting why did white consider g4 in this position let's imagine if white does nothing hold on a sec if white does nothing say white just does this i can't i'm not entirely sure i can actually tell you a winning recipe here to be honest the engine is not picking up anything at depth 23 if king e2 was played the, the reason i'm pausing at the critical pull moves is they're irreversible the pawn moves so king e2 unless is unless anyone could see a, a win with black a winning plan i'm not entirely sure i can see it myself this would just be equal right it would just be opposite color bishops you'd think it'd be virtually equal now if we try and probe with knight with knight a4 well we lose the a7 pawn so in a way that that knight's restricted to a7 okay uh, so anyway g4 is played and now we have f takes g4 f takes g4 and and now h5 seemingly fixing the pawns and these pawns are away from the color of the opponent's bishop so that's good sometimes to so keep your pawns away from the color of the opponent's bishop in the end game king g3 so in a way this knight is a prisoner to the a7 pawn but in this particular position Kramnik now goes for it he ventures in with knight a4 he sacks a7 he wants to get his knight aggressive so he sacks that pawn knight c3 which also controls against e4 for the moment anyway and he's threatening basically to try and win a pawn back with advantage after this check there's gonna be another check and taking a pawn we have bishop b8 check check so he's getting his pawn back now so again this knight's still a prisoner right and this knight's running around the place it's gone all around the shop and it's here finally white gets desperate now with this e4 which i mentioned years ago to get the knight out to b3 now if white doesn't do anything here it seems black does have a clearer winning plan now so say white does something with his king well we can just take here all right say we're not losing that pawn then the king can come in to win e3 anyway probably yeah king e4 and look at this knight. it's like playing a piece down yeah for sure so this is the point where the e pawn is jettisoned to get the knight to b3 it's here we have e4 it's a center pawn as i mentioned before bishop takes e4 knight b3 king d5 and this pawn is stopping both of these single-handedly by the way and conveniently in fact these three key pawns are away from the color of the bishop so they can't be tortured by the bishop or munched knight d2 after knight e3 white actually felt the need to resign this position on move 45 uh, I think it's this e pawn is actually a winning trump card in this position uh, as an example here knight f5 we're just going to get our bits out of the way of the e pawn I would say bishop d3 and then we're just running with the e pawn this will be decisive there's no point trying to defend this position and the king's kind of locked out of the game as well by the way and these pawns are not going anywhere because of the single pawn stopping them so this is basically an extra center pawn crashing through without any resistance here so yeah it seems maybe if white had kept quiet and not played g4 he might have been able to hold the position it was a kind of mutual stalemate of the knights uh, not being able to move but once he played g4 then we have this critical like positional pawn sacrifice 
in this position. First, the scene is set with h5, fixing the pawns. And this positional pawn sacrifice, which basically, if you want to win in chess, you have to do these positional pawn sacrifices or positional sacrifices. Because it needs to be part of the toolkit because the opponent's calculations are linear. Sometimes the opponent's only calculating a few moves ahead, three or four moves ahead. You inject a positional sacrifice into it, they can often miss that. It's, it's very difficult to calculate the positional pawn sacrifice. It works here. It gets the pawn back, it leaves the knight trapped. What did you think of this game? Was this a good positional game as well? It seems a piece was tortured in this game as well. Ooh. Okay, so yeah, that, that was an interesting game. So he won with black against the Catalan. Okay, um, let's go on to another game. The third game I'd like to show you. The, the, other, the fourth is already on the YouTube com, uh, King's Crusher channel where he played top lot. Fantastic game. Um, but the other game I'd like to show you is against Imanchuk. I don't think Imanchuk was this. I don't think one of Imanchuk's pieces were necessarily disabled in this. If you're looking for that theme, no, I'm not sure that theme exists. In the game, in this last game, I'd like to show you. Um, so Ivanchuk playing white. So e4. So Ivanchuk two seven two six. These are serious opponents. So Kramnik again at the time of the game two seven seven seven. So e5. Knight f3. Knight c6. And it's like primary school chess, bishop c4, bishop c5. So who would have thought, this is like a primary school opening for me. <laughs> the Gokyo piano stuff. Sidelines though, white plays now c3. Uh, and then, okay, what is that really trendy in this position? Yeah, apparently it is. It's the most popular, in fact, c3 instead of castling. I think the primary school kids would often play castling, yeah? But no, this is a grandmaster game, so the grandmasters play c3. Okay, so knight f6. Uh, I think that's actually the most popular move as well. So d3 was played, not d4. d3. We have an ever so quiet Gyoko Pianismo, ever so quiet with d3. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so d6, bishop b3, and black gives his bishop an escape square back. If needed, a6, the bishop can come back to a7. Knight bd2. Bishop e6, not minding saying that I don't mind having double pawns here because you know maybe this f file will be useful later. White ignores that. And black castles. Rookie one. Which has sometimes the property that if it discourages sometimes d5 from black is e5 frontal pressure. So it's kind of discouraging d5 quite often. h6. And you might think, well, h6, was that actually just necessary? I don't want to labor too much on these moves, but it's, it's one of the most popular anyway. It's some sort of theory. Bishop a7 has also been played before. So h6 is very popular. Even though you might think, well, if a knight comes to f5, it's, it's more difficult to kick it. Sometimes that's the price you pay. You, you want to stop things like bishop g5 later. Because the bishop's over here. If you imagine a horrible pin here after knight f1, it, it, the lesser evil might be just to play h6. So knight f1 without worrying too much about the pin now because we've covered that. <clears throat> now black took on b3, queen takes b3 and doesn't consider his pawn being attacked. 
really because he plays rook e8 uh, so you might think hold on what about this pawn let's just quickly look at this from a technical point of view knight a5 just actually traps the queen here elegantly just in case you were wondering yeah so that's, that's the poison pawn immediately poison pawn bishop e3 and doesn't this help white if black takes from here the aforementioned knight coming to f5 is surely an attractive thing for white to do but black indeed just takes on e3 knight takes e3 and now queen uh, d7 is played um, in this position queen d7 it turns out white might actually be threatening queen takes b7 in this particular position so i just want to make sure of that here oh there's queen takes i can't show you that let's just keep let's just give black a move which is not let's just do this queen takes knight a5 we've got b4 here that's the critical thing we've got b4 okay so actually i just want to show you that because queen d7 make sure that b7 is not on so if queen takes b7 here then we just trap the queen like this you know we're protecting the knight okay so that pawn's not on after queen d7 h3 pardon me h3 now conversely i said h6 weakens f5 but this might weaken f4 if a knight ever gets to f4 then it's going to be difficult to kick that's the immediate thing i think about when playing playing moves like h6 and h3 it's like you're saying to the opponent Look, if you ever get a knight here that's going to be more painful than usual yeah but again the purpose of h3 what is black actually threatening in relation to g4 i'm not entirely sure actually so i don't know uh the engine's choice here was not h3 it was a4 or rook a d1 h3 wasn't mentioned i'm not sure there was a threat that needed h3 but from the subsequent course of the game i can tell you something else about h3 rather cheekily that actually even has got an aggressive idea with h3 it's it's not about stopping a knight going to g4 it's actually supporting knight g4 himself maybe to try and crash through with g5 later with the h file you can imagine the king getting on the h file so it's got an aggressive idea with h3 and it's it's this idea which sets the subsequent contours of the end game actually believe it or not so knight e7 uh knight h2 so both knights can use the g4 square now c6 rook ad1 black plays d5 and now we have this knight g hg4 so supported by that h3 pawn knight takes and now h takes g very aggressive h takes g aggressive looking uh when there's double pawns something interesting about peace activity what is interesting here about the double pawns let's have a look rook a d8 and now white plays d4 we have e takes d4 rook takes d4 and the queen steps out of the way with queen c8 and possibly black's interested in playing c5 now we have rook ed1 now in this position uh, let's see c5 does that actually work he did he actually played b5 if we play c5 actually the rook can just step back and that might be uncomfortable for black this position here if takes we can take here take here take here and this is apparently a clear advantage to white it's a clear advantage yeah because that g pawn is actually stopping move like f5 so we're actually dropping e4 here yeah if that e pawn drops yeah white's doing fantastically well 
so c5 is out of the question we have b5 and you might think what about the d5 pawn let's just test this in the game queen c2 was played if he takes on d5 knight takes I mean this this is no problem this is no problem for black this position here because g4 is hanging and it takes we just exchange prisoners okay so we have queen c2 d takes e4 liquefying liquidating the center knight d5 hitting the queen queen steps back queen e6 we're going to transition into an end game now of this uh, white played queen f5 apparently this is the move to play if he plays knight takes d5 this might be a tiny bit better for black tiny bit he takes here whoops if he takes here this is okay for black it's more than okay all right so uh, we have Queen f5 and yeah we we get this endgame transition into this rook and pawn ending and rook and pawn endings are the most common type of end games that happen in chess so yes we're gonna look at another rook and pawn ending okay so g4 King h7 h5 so he's trying to splinter the pawns and it's a common pattern you may have observed that if the opponent has certain pawn weaknesses and you manage to fragment the pawns later as the end game evolves it's often the case you're winning some pawns and you're generating pass pawns quicker than the opponent so is that going to be the case here these pawn weaknesses might lead to some pawns dropping off and faster pass pawns basically g takes rook d6 b3 no rush to take these pawns or go for them yet a5 why a5 I'm not entirely sure a5 was played anyway knight takes d5 rook d takes d5 you see the diced pawns this spells trouble this is the prelude uh, to black's pawns being quite strong on on the king side c4 takes takes rook takes d4 and now one of them drops off and the other one's attacked so we're gonna have past pawns being born soon rook d7 f6 rook a7 now the rook is actually also got this one to torture so actually there's successfully for black he's managed to create four pawn islands in white's camp the pawn structure here is more solid and this rook and pawn ending is difficult to hold for white a pawn down king g2 king g6 f4 rook c5 at leisure it can take on c4 if needed king f5 and now he does offer the a pawn for the c pawn c5 because he's going to be winning this one next and then we'll have two past pawns a4 check and now king takes f4 so he's got two past pawns and white can't even take that without losing a4 so white actually resigned here So let that be a lesson to you. Next time you think about playing h3 with an idea of knight g4, just remember this game. Yeah, you just lose in the rook and pawn ending. Your pawns will become weak. Uh, the opponent will fragment your pawns into multiple pawn islands. You'll lose a key pawn, and you're going to lose a horrible, painful rook and pawn ending. So next time you play h3 with white, just bear this game in mind. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about this game it wasn't particularly that interesting but it shows that he's beating the super gms with the black pieces and he's determined to do so as humans you know we can say where there's a will there's a way you know to, to, to it's 
he found ways to gain advantages with the black pieces in the European Cup. This this was just as amazing in some respects as, as the as the other one. So yeah, uh, he won four games in the European Cup and didn't lose any. He also beat uh, Toplov, uh, so he drew one. So he's back in the world top ten, very firmly at rank four now in the live book. In in the live book in the live ratings. <laughs> so anyway, um, so any any further comments or questions on YouTube? Remember to press like if you like this video. I think that might help boost it in the future. So any likes appreciated. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, see you next week. In the next Kings Crusher radio show. Okay. Thanks very much. Hope you got something from these three key games. Thanks on play chess. See you next week.